We're glad to see that you're so engaged. You should thank the teachers for hosting these forums. They're important, and uh, I don't recall actually ever ever uh, having the opportunity that you had to have candidates come in and, and speak directly with you. It's sort of live, up and close, in person. Uh, I am the product of the Denham Public School System. I graduated from high school in 1981. And actually, my favorite high school story is uh, I grew up with three brothers and a sister, and my parents sent me to tennis camp the summer uh, going into the the ninth grade of high school and fully expected that I would go out for tennis in the spring. And coming off the basketball season at Dedham High School, I was courted and recruited by the track coach at Dedham High to obviously not run the distance, but uh, to uh, throw the shot put javelin and discus. So I went home, I was all excited. I said, Mom, Dad, I'm all excited. I'm going to go out for the track team. I said, track team? I spent $800 sending a tennis camp. You know, what the hell are you going to do on the track team? And I said, I'm going to throw the shot put, I'm going to throw the javelin, I'm going to throw the discus. So uh, my mother, in her excited voice, said, you know, when you're 25 years old, no one's ever going to call you up and say, let's go throw the javelin. <laughs> she was right. My 25th birthday came and went, and no one ever did call me up and ask me to throw the javelin. But I had a, a great, a great uh, time at Dedham High School, uh, and being part of the girls' track team, which excelled back then, uh, was a great part of that experience at Dedham High. And what I didn't know at the time is that later on, learning how to throw and catch the javelin would serve me very well in, in the world of politics. So here I am. Who am I and why am I running for Congress? My name is Mary Ann Lewis. I'm from Situate. Uh, and I'm running for the 10th Congressional District, which runs from Quincy and Weymouth all the way south out to the Cape and Islands all the way down here. And I've been traversing 40 cities and towns over the last couple of months and, and listening and, and interacting with folks like you um, and, and your parents and your siblings and your cousins and your teachers. And it's been, it's been a great experience. As I stated, I graduated from Dedham High School on the product of the public school system, which I thought was a great experience. My husband would like to have a, a word or two with my home economics teacher, but beyond that, I thought it was a great experience. I'm a mother. I have two teenage sons. Patrick and Matthew Kearney, they're students at Boston College High School. They're 15 and 13 years old. Uh, when I graduated from high school, I went on to Trinity College in Washington, D.C., where I earned my Bachelor of Arts degree. And I went to law school nights at Catholic University and had the great privilege of working for the then Speaker of the House, Thomas P. O'Neill, who had a residence here in this town. Tip O'Neill, if, uh, if you recall your history and your government, was the congressman from the 8th Congressional District here in Massachusetts, and was the longest serving consecutive speaker in the history of our country. And it was a great privilege uh, as a young person to work and learn from him. And back then there was a, a great deal of civility, I think, that was involved in politics that is missing today from the discussion and the discourse in Washington, D.C. I came back to the Boston area after graduating from law school, was an assistant district attorney in Suffolk County, and then I had the great privilege of serving in the Massachusetts House of Representatives um, as state representative from the North, 11th Norfolk District. I made history as a member of the Massachusetts House of Representatives as being the first woman ever to chair a committee in the history of the Commonwealth. And in my second term, I was promoted to a leadership position where I played an instrumental role in implementing over 40 tax cuts, creating jobs, and saving over $3 billion in a rainy day account. And I share that experience with you because I feel very proud of the accomplishments that I was able uh, to play a leadership role in as a member of the House of Representatives here in Massachusetts. We made uh, this state a much uh, more business friendly, uh, we created a, a, a degree of certainty, if you will, for businesses to come in and, and uh, climate, uh, for business friendly uh, state, for businesses to come in and create jobs and for businesses to retain jobs and stay here. And that's important to do. You can create a degree of certainty for small businesses and create jobs by doing that through intelligent tax policy. So in 2003, I left the legislature. I started my own independent lobbying and consulting firm, which I still operate today, and I'm also engaged in the private practice of law. So why am I running? I'm running because I'm concerned, as are many of you. I'm concerned about the number of people that have lost jobs in this district, and the state, and this country. I'm concerned about people losing their homes. And I'm a little bit angry, actually, that it could happen to so many people in this country. I think something is very wrong in Washington, D.C., 
And I'm running as an independent because I think one of the things that's wrong is our two, the, the way that I've currently, that our two-party system <coughs> is set up. It relies too heavily on the philosophies of two parties. You end up in a very polarized, unproductive uh, rhetoric and discourse with lost civility. And I think that uh, they've lost the focus of what government is intended and created to do, which is to serve the people. Uh, right now, I think our two-party system is racked with gridlock, it's ineffective, and it's very self-serving. So that's why I present myself as an independent candidate, someone who will represent and be loyal to the people of the 10th Congressional District and not be beholden to a, a national party agenda or a two-party, one of the other two-party systems, uh, and will not be engaged in partisan uh, rhetoric or uh, adhere to any strict partisan agenda. So that's why I'm running as an independent. So what is it? what is it take or what's the challenges that are involved in running as an independent versus a Democrat or a Republican? Uh, there are many. Uh, there are also, in my opinion, some advantages. Uh, the challenges are that you don't, there isn't currently a party structure in place for independence and uh, you don't receive the national financial support that accompanies that party structure. So you'll see in this, in particular in this race, uh, lots of money is coming in from outside of this district and outside of the state to support the Republican and the Democratic nominee. Some of that money we know where it emanates from and some of it quite frankly we don't. It's sort of a lack of transparency. I think that's an issue that needs to be addressed uh, at the federal level as well. That's the bad news. The good news is f for whatever reason the folks that are spending that money in my opinion have not spent it wisely. They have engaged in a lot of unproductive, negative uh, campaign, a lot of rhetoric back and forth, and it hasn't, at the end of the day, served either the Democratic or the Republican nominee very well. And usually we can't really find out exactly what the impact of that negative campaigning is because <coughs> if the person wins, they say, well, the negative campaign worked. And if they lose, they say, well, you know, the negative campaign didn't work. But people don't usually have a third choice, and in this case, they do. So people are looking very seriously at our candidacy uh, because they feel a little disenfranchised, and they feel that what's happening in this particular race epitomizes what is wrong in Washington with our two-party system and the unproductive rhetoric back and forth. Uh, the good news about running as an independent is it uh, forces you to engage in more retail politics, uh, which we are doing uh, fast and furiously. We're up early or we stay up later. We interact with more people on a retail basis every day than, than all the other candidates combined. And that's a great, great experience. And I, I think one of the sort of treasures of, of, of running for office in a campaign, you interact with folks from all over the district, from diverse economic and social uh, backgrounds, from different age groups. You hear and understand their concerns. You get a sense of what uh, people are thinking. And I get a kick out of it when I hear or read polls and, and uh, people will say, well, have you done a poll? And I say, yeah, I just went to the Cranberry Festival in, in Falmouth and I went to the Hingham Festival and uh, Oktoberfest in Hingham. And when you interact with people, it's your own poll. So you get a sense of what's happening and what's on people's minds. So what does it really entail to run in general for office? I would suggest uh, as seniors in high school that the first and foremost thing that you have to possess when you are weighing a decision to run for office is, is it in your heart and is it in your gut? And you do a heart and gut check. And if it's in your heart and gut, then that's the first step. That's the first test that you have to meet. And if it is, then, then you need to take the, the next steps, which involve a whole bunch of things. But one is, do you have a desire to serve? Do you have a desire to run? Do you have, you know, and then you have to get into sort of the, uh, the if that emotional checklist uh, takes place and is positive, then you have to get a realistic uh, view of the field. Do you understand the community that you want to represent? Uh, do you think that you can raise the money to do it? Do you think that you can put the organization together to do it? What is the climate? Uh, what, are the, what are the particular circumstances to that seat that you're looking at? Is there an incumbent? Is it an open seat? Uh, you know, and, and where do you fit into that spectrum, if you will? So again, running as an independent, we don't have the in-place party structure of the respective uh, Democratic and Republican uh, organizations. But I have a big family. Um, my husband has a big family. We have a lot of uh, friends uh, through social network and professional network. 
and we felt that we did have the organization in place uh, to to tap into to fill that necessary part of campaign, and we've done that quite effectively. Uh, can you raise the money? Well, there's there's two parts to money in a campaign. There's one the ability to raise it. Two, there's the you know the, it's the ability to spend it wisely and efficiently. And there's lots of different ways you can do that in this wonderful world of technology. I don't have to tell you, you, you guys, you're much more uh, apt at it than, than someone of my generation of 47. Social networking is a huge part of what will eventually narrow and close the money gap in elections. And you're the generation that's going to really be able to, to unleash that and take full advantage of it. We just, I think, tinkering out around the edges, edges of it. Uh, so. The other thing that's been, you know, we can't afford it. Our campaign cannot afford to advertise on television on the big stations four, five, and seven. But we can't afford to go through the Comcast um, and Verizon uh, networking through cable. We are able to target certain demographics, and we've done that so we can we can spend our money more efficiently and more effectively. I think the dollar to dollar impact on the street uh, we will be able to compete with. Uh, and I am very fortunate that I have a lot of time and talent that's being dedicated and devoted to me. Uh, we have three great radio ads that are running on stations throughout the Cape and uh, Plymouth and the South Shore. And, you know, all three were written by my brother, who's very talented uh, mind. And actually, a lot of times in politics, if you get someone that's not political and is thinking outside the box, that ad's going to have a greater impact uh, on the public, and we're finding that that's, that's to be the case. But again, we keep, don't have the money to, to advertise on some of the uh, Boston media radio stations. Uh, but most of them don't come down here anyway. So there are, there are ways that you can more efficiently and effectively uh, have your, uh, the impact of your dollar felt on, on, a, on a community level. Uh, we're proud to say that we've received the first print media endorsement in this race from the Barnstable Patriot. And just today, which is very exciting news for us, we uh, learned that we received the endorsements of the Wicked Local Community Place papers, which run throughout the 10th Congressional District. Uh, so I think that we have done quite well at meeting the challenges that an independent would face uh, in a race like this. And um, quite frankly, the other component in politics is, is, is to get lucky in a few aspects. And I think we've gotten lucky in a few aspects in terms of the tone that this particular race has taken and that, and that people are not, uh, they're rejecting it. Uh, and so they are looking for an alternative and when they do look at us, they feel comfortable and confident and my ability uh, to represent this district and address the very pressing needs of this district. What do I think those are? First and foremost, jobs, jobs, and more jobs. So what qualifies me to address you know, the important issues of, of this district better than anyone else? I think I have the appropriate background, experience, knowledge, and skill set to best address them. And someone that isn't beholden to a national party organization, in my opinion, is going to be able to best advocate advocate on behalf of this district. I think I understand the fabric of this district better than anyone else in this race. Uh, the, the very defining characteristic of, of this 10th Congressional District is our coast. For this region, that's a very important component to it. And we have a very important uh, fishing and lobster industry that, that seems to be overburdened with uh, regulations and taxation. And when you see lobstermen and, and fishermen spend thousands of dollars on fuel and give up uh, very important days during their season to take their boats over to Martha's Vineyard in protest of what is uh, emanating from Washington in terms of federal regulation when the president's there, then obviously there's a very uh, negative disconnect uh, between Washington and what's happening, happening to a very important industry uh, in our region. We have to maintain our coasts and protect them and understand the, the environmental treasure that we have here right underneath uh, and, uh, our noses. We host scientists and tourists from all over the country and all over the world because of it. But we have to balance that appropriately, understanding the economic engine that, that uh, it provides to this region. It's an important industry that, that fuels and uh, subsidizes uh, and accompanies all sorts of small businesses. From the person who sells the ice, to the gas, to the riggers, the equipment, who repairs the boats, uh, and, and the company tourism that goes along uh, with it. So uh, very, very important to understand and create a climate and the appropriate balance. And it's incumbent upon the next congressperson 
from this district to make sure that that happens in an appropriate fashion.